I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our physics study group led by John Harland. And he's continuing to teach uh, me and you about uh, his framework for quantum mechanics. He's a functional analyst uh, and doing original research on the connection between classical uh, physics and quantum physics. And uh, he uh, gave a rehearsal of some of the basics of this framework. He'll be reviewing that in the first 25 minutes or so. And then today, he's talking about the transform. It's a version of the Fourier transform that will take us from position space to momentum space. And there's advantages to momentum space uh, that in future episodes uh, he'll make use of. Uh, and in future episodes, he'll set up the Schrodinger's equation. Um, and then uh, with that uh, equation in momentum space, it turns out that uh, it's very easy to deal with uh, particles in free space. And it's very uh, straightforward to calculate um, the evolution of, let's say, a, a wave packet that's, let's say, very tight, and you want to see how it will disperse, right? So this is uh, all types of machinery to build up towards that in future episodes. And he, he is a functional analyst uh, uh, with a PhD from the University of California, San Diego. So he is giving the mathematician's paradise type of uh, view. <laughs> So we'll continue from where we left off last time. Let me grab those notes. Uh, so last time, let's kind of sweep through um, briefly what we did last time. Uh, last time, what did we do? We kind of uh, talked about the basic setup of quantum mechanics. So we talked about the basic quantum, quantum mechanical setup. You know, you've got this Hilbert space. You know, the question is, you know, why? You know, why are, why are, you know, um, you know the states of the system represented this way and you can you can actually make you can dig down i mean you, you can drill down into this stuff and maybe we will um at a later you know at a later time talking about quantum boolean algebras why why it kind of makes sense to use uh hilbert space uh, and 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 in particular the uh self adjoint operators on hilbert space to to uh, represent physical quantities, self-adjoint operators take the place of random variables in a normal probability space, and 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 projections uh, take the uh, or actually just you know mutually orthogonal subspaces take the take the role of of events in a normal probability space so you kind of have to you have to do this kind of funny business to dress up your sample space you know your your probability um foundation to what's called a quantum boolean algebra or a quantum sample space and in in that context it makes sense to talk about hilbert space and and uh projections on Hilbert space onto orthogonal subspaces and observables or quantum random variables or simply uh, self-adjoint operators which have an intimate connection with projections via the spectral theorem. So I mean there is a there is a there is a context and, and maybe we'll talk about that later, you know, at some later lecture. Um, I think it's it's interesting, you know, it's I think it's interesting for us to understand that. I think it it helps mm -hmm. it helps kind of dig down into the into the logic of, of this whole edifice. Anyway, we talked about the Schrodinger equation and self-adjoint operators, uh, the time evolution uh, equation, which is basically the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, and the way to get solutions of a Schrodinger equation are simply to, to apply this unitary group of operators to the initial state and you get this, uh, what looks like an impossibly difficult thing to compute. But in fact, if you break up the state into eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, 
then everything becomes extremely simple. <clears throat> so in particular, the time evolution now looks like if you know your eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, the time evolution of a wave function can be written down like this, which is a much more explicit formula. And I have a, I have a question. Uh, this breakup of that uh, wave function, that's a breakup from the observer's point of view when they're measuring, right? Like those eigenfunctions have to do with measurements. They do. They have to do well. They have to do the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, and so, you know, actually, no. Um, the measurements. The measurements are okay. So this is where this is where it gets a a little bit a little bit involved because your measurements are in like a uh, position momentum other kinds of things spin those are those are you know involve these self adjoint operators and you could talk about the you could talk about the uh eigenfunctions of those self adjoint operators um but they may not be the same eigenfunctions as the hamiltonian mm -hmm. um and so you know, it it uh, presents a, a bit of a problem <laughs> um, that, and, you know, the question is, uh, you know, can you always, you know, if you can find the eigenfunctions of your Hamiltonian, write your initial state in terms of those eigenfunctions, you can, in principle, know everything about the system now and at every future mm -hmm. point in time. Not always easy, though, right? Um and spectral theory is not, you know, spectral decomposition is not necessarily an easy task. And the main thing in quantum mechanics that helps you is symmetries. If you have symmetries of your Hamiltonian, or symmetries mm -hmm. of the system, then that uh, vastly simplifies the the um, the spectral decomposition. Because if you know the eigenfunctions of the symmetries, for example, if you know, for example, that your Hamiltonian is invariant under rotations, if you know the eigenfunctions of representations of the rotations, in other words, the spherical harmonics, those are automatically going to be eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So, so symmetries are one way. You know, that's one way that symmetries are used in quantum mechanics and turn, you know, to simplify spectral decomposition. And there's other ways, uh, other other ways mm -hmm. to creep in too, but uh, without those, and if you just have some complicated Hamiltonian, um, then you know it's it's a difficult road indeed. You know, trying to trying to describe mm -hmm. a, a physical system, especially in time. So I think you know. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, c kind of uh, moving along here. Mm -hmm. If you have an absor observable, you know, the Born rule, basically the way, you know, we connect, um, you know, observables to, which are self-adjoint operators, to actual measurements is via the Born rule. The Born rule is, uh, you know, an axiom of quantum mechanics. And it says that if you do this computation, of um, then this gives you the at each time t the average value of this observable which is mm -hmm. what you're actually going to find in the laboratory like that you know the experiments that you do in the laboratory will have a certain um, we'll have a certain variability, but the average of the mean is going to be given by this computation, this theoretical computation, which is basically telling you how to connect all this abstract stuff to actual measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, the question, the question is, you know, how, you know, what is the time variation of an observable, and if you work that out, you find out that it looks like this. 
um, the time um, the derivative in time of an observable is given by the average of another observable, which is this commutator. This commutator is a self-adjoint operator. And, um, and so if you look at the time average of this one over H, one over I H times the, the Lie bracket of A and H, then that's going to give you the the time derivative of the observable, which is interesting because it says that if your observable commutes with a Hamiltonian, then mm -hmm. the time derivative is zero. That means that the average value of that observable does not change in time. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's sort of the the sophisticated version of Noether's theorem. That's the it uh, means it's conserved, right? It's if, conserved. if it's not changing yeah, that's right. it's not changing. with regard to time. So, you know, you can do Noether's theorem in terms of Hamiltonian systems. You can do Noether's theorem in terms of Lagrangian systems. But to me, uh, the most satisfying way of looking at all that stuff is by looking at unitary, the unitary dynamics that comes out of all that. So every Hamiltonian system can be written in terms of the unitary dynamics and vice versa. And so when you do that, you this is this is sort of the formalism that talks that replaces Hamiltonian and, and Lagrangian dynamics. And this would be this would be, I think, the the version of Nerthos theorem. That would be an, another interesting chapter. That would be another, I think, I think um, in fact, you know, just as important as quantum Boolean algebras. I think that that mm -hmm. whole thing is, is important. And um so that's great if, that um, if, that you know we'll, we're putting this down and then you can branch off in different places. Yeah, so I think that I think in the future I'd like to I'd like to do a series of talks about that, you know, because mm -hmm. um you just never find a place where it's all consolidated like that. I I you know, Nerthus theorem in terms of Hamilton well, Hamiltonian dynamics, Lagrangian dynamics and unitary dynamics, the connection between all three of them. And the expression of Noether's theorem in all three of them, and what symmetries look like in all three of them, and um, basically symmetries are just self-adjoint operators that commute with a Hamiltonian, um, or a group of self-adjoint operators that commute with a Hamiltonian. More precisely, it's the unitary operators from those self-adjoint operators, E V I times a self-adjoint operator that forms a unitary group that commutes with the unitary dynamics of the system. So you can talk about it down on the Hamiltonian level, which is sort of the Lie group level, or you can talk about the Lie group um, level. I mean, I'm sorry, the Lie algebra level is when you're talking about the Hamiltonians. Hamiltonian is the infinitesimal generator of the one parameter Lie group U, U sub T, which is the Hamiltonian, the unitary dynamics. Um, so you talk about things down on a Lie group level, Lie, uh, up on the Lie group level or down on the Lie algebra level. So that whole suite of ideas is all connected. You know, I think it's important to have that kind of solidly connected. I would say that it's, that is quite the way it works in my mind yet, but it would be nice to boil all that stuff down and do some examples of like systems that have, maybe or two dimensional systems that have, have a rotational symmetry. Um, or or translational symmetry um, and to see how that all works out in Lagrangian, Hamiltonian and unitary dynamics I think I think it'd be very instructive um, and that would set us up for understanding for example Lorentz you know Lorentz invariant dynamics mm -hmm. and and why the Dirac equation takes on its particular form Anyway, that's all looking forward. Um, so the uncertainty principle can also be expressed in terms of all this machinery. You're looking at the expected value of this operator here, which is sort of the variance operator. And um, it turns out that you can write it out in terms of, of the commutator of an operator, uh, two operators. So if two operators commute, and this is zero, then in principle, 
um, there's no limit on accuracy on, right? on accuracy to measuring both certainty right certainty at the same time they do not commute then then uh then there's okay so it's the non-commutativity which is the basis for heisenberg's uncertainty principle that's right that's right okay so we're looking at the self-adjoint operator now m sub x and i'm sorry i'm kind of going going over this in a lot of detail i'm not sure i need to um is this mm -hmm. helpful or it's helpful for me, yeah, and I think sure it's a it, you know we're, you're moving along. Yeah. Um, so when you compute when you compute that, yeah, you know, okay, what does the Born rule say about this abstract operator multiplication by x on 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 Hilbert space? Uh, and then you compute the Born rule, you get this interesting you get this interesting uh, uh, expression that looks like the average or you know, the mean value of x against a probability distribution. So the Born rule naturally leads to thinking of this as a probability distribution on position. And this as being the average position at any given time. So the operator of multiplying by x g g g ends up meaning that position. it's the yeah, position. And, and why does it mean position? Because of the Born rule. OK. OK. So the Born rule, again, is what connects um states and operators to actual measurements in, in the laboratory you know observables and and, and pre-probabilities or, or wave functions to 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 measurements in the laboratory and so born originally expressed it like this you know said that the the square mm -hmm. of the wave function you know the square of the modulus of the wave function is the probability of finding particle at x but more generally, we use the Born rule in, you know, for any observable like this. Um, and just so, uh, just uh, to say, so it's combining um, the the wave function that's determining the situation with the operator of interest, which would be let's say multiplying by x, right, or or right, which becomes position. It's combining these two. That's right. And so, uh, and it's the combination is what gives you. The uh, expected value, I guess, uh, the the of of that. Uh, yeah. Quantity. So, I mean, you know, I mean, this is not the way of you would teach it to a physics student, right? You would mm -hmm. because physics students aren't they're not con comfortable with self-adjoint operators. They're not comfortable with unitary dynamics. They're not comfortable with um, you know inner product and all that. You know, this is mm -hmm. this is truly a, you know a mathematician's. Uh, view of looking at things and and um i think both have their both have their place um building up you know what a wave function is and and all that stuff mm -hmm. you know is is important intuitively so i mean to me both approaches are valid both are necessary for me um, so and, so, and so for me, what this is saying, uh, because I'm translating everything from a wave function point of view into a you know orthogonal polynomial point of view, instead of a wave function, you know, like with um, you know, which which includes the square root of whatever your weight function would be, like I'm just thinking of a I'm thinking of a orthogonal polynomials, but you you know, if there's no operator and you're squaring it, you're basically just demonstrating that it's orthogonal. But uh, what happens if you have an operator that you're including? That operator is acting on one of them, and then it's uh, transforming it, like you know. And so it'll transform your wave function. You know, it's and supposing that your wave function is, uh, you know, one of these orthogonal orthogonal uh, polynomials. Uh, it will transform an orthogonal one into a collection a sum, let's say with different coefficients, but only the original one will survive. And so you're integrating against the uh, the uh, original one. So so like if you multiply by x, that'll give you a new orthogonal polynomial uh, expansion. And then you'll see, but which which one, which will be the term that was kind of like uh, uh, the original polynomial, what's the coefficient? And so that's how. So
so I guess it's this notion of like dispersal or like a wiggling or like, you know, like a, if you if you affect something, but what's the chance that it was not affected, I guess, even. That's what's well, yeah, because that's all that survives, right? In the case of orthogonal. I mean, I, I think I think boiling that this down to some kind of combinatorial um you know set of operations would be really interesting. I just mm -hmm. I mean, but this I is think, even before the ortho this is just uh this is just uh, looking at orthogonal polynomials and just saying that uh uh this is a variation of orthogonality just saying if you take one of you know if 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 if, if you if they're equal and you integrate the square you'll get a constant or you know if they're not equal then they'll, you'll get zero but if you uh expand it uh you know if you if you multiply one of them if you operate on one of them you're going to get a a set of coefficients times you're going to get an expansion um and and you'll the question is you know what survives of the original one you know how does it get transferred anyway so that's a for that's another topic like you know for the yeah. future yeah no, i think it's I, I think it's important for you to know that you know, this stuff in order to make progress on that you know yeah this is helpful yeah thanks so So in other words, we're saying that, you know, what is this abstract quantity really? It's the expected value of X. It's the expected mm -hmm. value of your position. So, okay. So now, now comes the fun. Like, what about, what if we take a look at the, the velocity? Mm -hmm. In other words, take the time derivative of the average value of X. And they say, oh, okay, I know what that is. That's this, this, uh, I know how to compute that. That's this uh, average value of this bracket operator, this this commutator operator. And uh, so you work out the commutator and- So so, so just slow down. Uh, and you know that because of Schrodinger's equation or like, what, why do you know oh, that? Oh, no, that came, that that, came that, from- That came from up there, right? Came from up here, yeah. That came from- Oh, the derivative uh, was, you just passed it up, yeah. Yeah, it came from, well, it- yeah, it does come. It it comes from the it's fact. It's just that, lower. It's just lower. Yeah. Yeah. It come. It comes from the fact it's that right H here. Gives you yeah. time evolution. You know, H, mm -hmm. H uh, gives you the time evolution. Why does H give you the time evolution? Because of this junk here. Because of you and, know, uh, just just right to here. ask right, and so that's yeah. I'm curious. Like, where does the I H bar come in? But I guess that's where it's coming in. It's coming in. Uh, well, we're down on yeah, we're down on the Lie algebra level here. So we're. Uh, we don't have the u operator we're dealing it's because we're taking the derivative with respect to time and yeah. so and so that's where the i over h bar is coming in okay yeah that's right so you know it doesn't really have to do with the specific uh the specific form of the schrodinger equation here notice that we're not well it essentially it does you know it it does i mean that the schrodinger equation really is uh this right here it doesn't have to do with the specific form of h though we're only using mm -hmm. the fact that h is self-adjoint and um and basically what wait a minute there should be a i forgot this i forgot the time derivative here that was not good um so i put that mm -hmm. in all right that was a mistake and so what this is really saying is that H is giving you the time variation of, of H is giving you the time evolution of, of the wave function. Mm -hmm. Explicitly, that is given in this formula here. Mm -hmm. the unitary dynamics, the unitary group that comes from H. Anyway. Yeah, it's good you cut that. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not surprising that, that, the time variation of an observable of the average value in observable is given by, you know, is given in terms of age. Mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead and work it out for multiplication by X. Well, you know, we know what the Hamiltonian is. Now we're actually using the form of the Hamiltonian given by Schrodinger equation. And, um, and you work out that commutator and you wanna work out X times H minus H times X operating on a dummy function f and you just kind of work it out and you get um 
that uh, it's equal to this, the average value of this operator. Mm -hmm. And that means that M times this velocity is equal to the average value of this operator. And so that tells you that if you call this operator P, mm -hmm. it's saying that because of the Born rule that this operator must be associated with momentum. And and the mass uh, came in because of Schrodinger's equation, right? Because of the kinematics. Uh, That's the, right. The, okay. Yeah, the mass came in because of the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. This right, part, right from there, from the, the very the beginning. Part, okay. The part having to do the potential ends up canceling. It ends up being being irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the minus h bar squared over two. Right. So you're it's right. The, the kinematic part. You know the the that part there plays a role here. So um, so. This is the mathematician's way of thinking like, oh, well, this has to be the self-adjoint operator that that is related to momentum. And why is that? Because the average value of this operator mm -hmm. is um, gives you this quantity, which is the uh, M times the average position. Mm -hmm. or the time derivative of the average position. So. And that's a connection on the expected value level. So. Right, right. So if you want an operator that, that, that represents momentum, who's got the right expected value, it's got to be this guy. And this kind of almost speaks to what you're saying in the sense that classical is maybe more broader than quantum because this connection's on the broader level. It this is. is it's, not, on this, it's on this level. Yeah, that's right. It's not hip. So that's, and that's kind of curious. I mean, so th that speaks to what you're saying that that's actually, in a certain sense, uh, physically the more uh, relevant level. Yeah. Well, in a sense, the Born rule is the Born rule is um, that connection. It is, you know, Born is saying, you know, that that when you, you know, when you actually make observations mm -hmm. that, and you look at the mean, you know, it's going to, there's going to be variability. We accept that, but the mean of that is going to be interpret, interpretable in terms of some kind of classical, you know, some kind of, some kind of average measurement that happens in a laboratory. In other words, that affects mm -hmm. your classical, that has an effect on your, on your apparatus in the laboratory. Um, So it's going to be in often the way this is, it's a dot on a screen or it's a, you know, it, it, I mean, many of these things boil down to position measurements. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that means that, okay. That, so that's our, this is our starting point here is that, you know, moment momentum is given by that. And so, um, so where are we, where are we going to head from here? Let me add some pages. Let's just take a look at the Schrodinger equation again. Okay. This is kind of interesting here. This term here looks like the momentum operator divided by 2m Operating on five t. Oh, squaring it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because p squared is equal to what is the momentum operator? H h bar over i. H bar over i. And d dx. Yeah. H bar squared over negative one. 
squared dx squared. So it's negative x. Yeah, so it's negative x h bar squared. So it's another way of writing the Schrodinger equation um, mm -hmm. for that momentum operator. And um, so what is the point here? Well, and then the, what you've gotten rid of, then you you don't have the partial with respect to x, so that's already built into the momentum. Yeah, it's already built into the moment momentum operator. Now, the question is: Is there a way of writing this so that this, you know? Um, looks like is there some kind of a transformation where we can rewrite this where where we can write rewrite this so that this looks like this whole thing looks like in this new transformed um, wave function, this whole thing looks like multiplication by some parameter P. So this is, and I want to distinguish between capital P and little p. So I'll use maybe a script, you know, like little p like this. Mm, okay. Multiplication by P that um, p squared over 2m gets transformed into multiplication by p over 2m. In other words, p gets transformed into multiplication by p. So you have because, to do it uh, multipl multiplication by p, you have to do that twice. Right. So, so in other words, h bar over i ddx gets transformed into multiplication by p mm -hmm. on this new in this new realm um now mm -hmm. why would we ever want to do that because then this becomes a multiplication operator it's a much simpler kind of thing to deal with mathematically mm -hmm. uh, i don't know this mo uh, I, i'm not sure i i think that this is the best way of motivating this maybe they're maybe we'll think about a better way of motivating it um but in other words is there some kind of a mathematical transformation that takes differentiation into multiplication and we know what that is well and maybe just to jump in here with my half-baked thought but but this whole notion that like when you're looking at the averages you know by the born rule you're in this kind of like classical domain or you're in this meta you know, big, big world, dom well, big picture domain where you're not, uh, you're saying, oh, that's real. It's not what's going on locally, you know, or immediately in the quantum world, it's real. But when you do this multiplication by P or by X, you see that is acting in the quantum world as a multiplication, um, you know, in at the, at the point, right? I mean, like specifically. So that's by converting the operator into the multiplication, you're kind of, reframing the whole thing you're saying that we're entering we're going to describe this in terms of what's actually happening in the quantum world supposedly yeah and so you know it i think maybe and and maybe just to say yeah. how kind of like strange that is you see because i mean one of the paradoxes or strangenesses of all this is that these variables are defined on a continuum, right? And that continuum has, you know, 100% accuracy at each point, right? Like, there's nothing fuzzy about uh, that whole world as described. That's right. Uh, it just It's just that it's, uh, in a certain sense, unreal, you know, in terms of the, you know, where you actually, when you actually end up making the measurements, it turns out it becomes, it's rather, I don't want to say fictional, but it's rather... Uh, you know preposterous or or just to kind of like uh so 
but that's what you're doing here by I think that's what you're doing here by relating that operator, which is basically from more of the flavor, you know, yielding stuff that makes sense in the in the world of measurables, right? And then uh, whereas the multiplication by the little p is something happening in the world of quantum imagination. So I'm not completely yeah. off track, right? Like, am I kind of, am, am I making I, sense or? I think so. Yeah. I mean, there, you know, this whole idea, oh, quantum mechanics is fuzzy. Um, it has to do with the way you're framing the problem. Like, I mean, a quantum system can be in a particular state. For example, you can measure something and spin up, mm -hmm. uh, spin mm -hmm. one half particle and spin up. And if you remeasure it, as long as you don't disturb it with any magnetic fields or anything, and you let it fly along, and you send it well, through but, a measure, but, measurement but spin apparatus, is it, it'll, but, still, it'll it'll still be spin one. It'll still be spin up. You know, in sure, other words, sure. But but the, that's a discrete case where you have two states. It's in one or the other, right? But here you're talking about a variable on a continuum, and the whole question is like, do any of those positions have any reality to them, right? Like, what could that possibly mean? Are they any in the definite a definite state? I have a feeling it's not elemental reality. That's for sure. You know, it's not not like spin. You're right. It's not like, you know, it is a it it is an invention. The real numbers, this continuum of numbers is kind of an invention. What you know, what would be a more wholesome way of thinking about the whole thing is 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 a is an open question. It's like reverse engineering. Like, well, right. We imagine right. that there could be, but that yeah. there's no. I think it's a I think it's a simplification. It's sort of like uh you know, sometimes in a limit, you know, things look much simpler. For example, uh, you know, the compound interest formula in a limit, you get the continuous interest formula, and it's much simpler. It's got e to the kx, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, this more complicated thing. So uh, you know, or um basically all the Successful limits in mathematics are, are like that. They, you know, in the limit, things look simpler. Um, and, and so what you're, what you're doing is you're crossing these two domains. I guess maybe that's the point. It's, so, it's, so it is very important, basically, what you're doing in some yeah. level. Yeah. Anyway, you know, so the idea is, you know, this momentum operator is very abstract. Uh, yes, yeah, differentiation, but... Is there some domain where you can look at that where it's just multiplication by like like a number, just like position is, mm -hmm. and then you can make sense of that number via the Born rule as actual momentum, as actually parameterizing momentum, and we know what that transformation is. In other words, the thing that takes you from differentiation to multiplication is the Fourier transform. Okay. Now you're asking why why am I doing this? I mean, what's wrong with the Schrodinger equation? Well, you know, uh, maybe we're doing it out of just curiosity. Like, in other words, trying to unpack what momentum means. Uh, but it also might be interesting, you know, writing this whole thing in momentum space, right? I mean, what does the Schrodinger equation look like in momentum space? And we're going to find out. In a certain sense, it's simpler. In certain sense, it's more complicated. This becomes simpler because that becomes multiplication. This becomes more complicated. <clears throat> Products mm -hmm. turn into convolutions when you take mm -hmm. Fourier transforms. And then we're going to find out how, you know, uh, later we're going to use this Fourier transform wave equation to solve uh, in a very direct way the, the free space evolution of a free space particle uh it's going to be simpler in momentum space than it is in in um in position space but let's not call it momentum space now we're just doing a mathematical transformation uh in particular the fourier transform let me just call this we'll call it f of a function f
I'll use the mathematician's Fourier transform. Uh, physicists scale it a little bit differently. So it's a Fourier transform. Why do I write it this way? Physicists don't like like to write it like that. They write it uh, slightly different without the two pi in there. And the reason why we do it this way is that this is unitary. That's why mathematicians like this mm -hmm. particular formula. In other words, F is a unitary operator on Hilbert space, which means that it preserves inner products. So it's one to one onto and preserves inner products and lengths. If it preserves inner products, it also preserves the norms of functions. So if you write it the physicist way, then it does not preserve inner products. Mm. You know, you have to use, and there's a, gonna be a, you know, the physicist write a one over square, square root of two pi and that, all that junk. And this avoids that mm. complication also. All right. So um, if you take the Fourier transform of the derivative, You need to write that out. I mean, you know, there's a formula. Uh, I have to re-derive the formula every single time. I That's fine. Let's see I, how you do I it. I just don't. I just, I find it onerous to try to memorize it. Um, it's just not natural for me. So you're doing this. Okay, so how do you compute this? Oh, you um, integrate by parts. But, you know, f goes to zero at infinity. So the, the integral of uh, the antiderivative of f prime is just f. But when you evaluate that at plus and minus infinity, you get zero. And so you're left with just this. You're left with the minus of f of x. And then the derivative of that, which is... Should there be an x in there? e to the minus 2 pi i x? Yes. X and um, when you differentiate this with respect to x, you pull down the minus two pi i times zeta, and then e to the minus two pi i x dx. And so the whole thing is just equal to negative or positive two pi i. And that's where I get- Do you still have to have the psi there? Oh, in mean, the exponential? You do. Okay. Um, and then you get that times this. So that's the Fourier transform. Mm. So it pulls down the 2 pi i. So basically... You're pulling, pulling it down is the same as multiplying. That's yeah. So, so in other words... Um, if we look at it this way. And then that explains how you, the minus signs cancel because of right. the integration so by parts. Basically what we're saying is that the Fourier transform of the derivative operator um, So what are we really saying? Is equal to the multiplication by two pi i zeta multiplication times the Fourier transform. In other words, the Fourier transform intertwines multiplication and differentiation. Mm -hmm. But in the different variables. Yeah. 
which 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 I guess you're you're living in different worlds. So you. You have a world of X and you have a world of Xi. Yeah. So it does exactly what we want, you know, but the problem is, is that we would like to, we want to intertwine H bar over I DDX with Um, we want this to be multiplication by the actual parameter. In other words, not by some scaled thing. Because we don't want to deal, we don't want two pi, we don't want that junk here. Now, the way to get rid of the i's, you simply, you know, divide out by the i here. Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna take care of that. But what about the h bar? Don't we divide by the i where? Well, we divide if we divide by the i here, it comes out over here. So, oh, okay. So let's let's just let me. And again, I'm sorry, I didn't really, you know, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip. So we're you know fumbling and mumbling here, and you know I would like to make this cleaner, but. The Fourier transform of one over i ddx is therefore intertwines multiplication by two pi. Okay. Okay. And so, so that means that the Fourier transform <laughs> um. I see. So it's not obvious what to do with the H bar, right? That's the problem. Yeah, it's not obvious what to do with the H bar. So, so um, with the H bar, I think um, we can, if we put in an H bar here. Anyway, I, I'm just going to cut to the quick. Okay, so I'm going to define a new Fourier transform. I think this is the way to define it. You define F, and I don't want to write a... I think I'm going to write sub H over here. Mm -hmm. I know it looks a little funny of F to be a scale Fourier transform. And so what you do is you scale by... You essentially scale by H. And what is it? It is... I think you... Uh, I wrote this down. I think it is F of HX. E to the minus two pi I. And I think this is unitary. Um, let me just make sure I got this right. Over H, rather. Oh. 
Got it totally wrong. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's like this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is equal to really the Fourier transform. Okay, that kind of makes more sense because you're yeah, bringing yeah. it in. Uh, yeah. And then you evaluate it. Yeah. Okay. And I think it okay. And I think because the normal Fourier transform is unitary, I think that it's possible. It's it's quite quite easy to see that this is unitary. In mm -hmm. other words, it's the scale. It's a scaled Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to define. this new function phi t at zeta to be the Fourier transform, this scaled Fourier transform, I'm sorry, let's just write out the compact notation. Uh, so in other words, we're gonna take the Fourier transform of our way our standard wave function and make a new function out of it mm. based, on, based on this and it turns out that if you compute everything out okay so we're going to take the and then psi of t is a is a function of x but phi of t is a function of psi that's right. the okay so the Schrodinger equation looks like this it's i h bar the derivative <clears throat> of this is all of x And if I slap down Fourier transform on both sides, the scaled Fourier transform, you can work this out, but on the right-hand side, because uh, the time operator commutes with all the, you know, the spatial variables, um, you can interchange Fourier transform with time, you know, the time derivative and that just gets distributed in to here. And we distribute this across here and here. Now what happens to the scaled Fourier transform of that first term? Well, that turns into multiplication. You get I H bar On the left, again, because mm -hmm. the Fourier transform commutes with the time uh, the the time derivative, and on the right hand side here, because you've scaled everything just right, you get zeta squared over two m times the scale. I mean the scale Fourier transform of phi, and there should be a t here, and plus, and what does Fourier transforms do to Convolutions, they, I mean, um, products, they turn them into convolutions, but it's not quite the convolution because we scaled everything. So this is what I call V sub H. Um, and V sub H of, um, say, a variable X is equal to V hx so sort of this scaled the scaled um 
so we could work out the details of this. Um, I mean, it's basically based on what we worked out here. Uh, it's worked, worked out here, but only do the whole thing with the scaled Borea transform. And you're going to get that this operator neg negative h bar squared uh, d squared but d dx squared transforms into this just multiplication by zeta squared transforms into a multiplication operator could you just uh, write down what the convolution is what's that could you just define the convolution for convolution. me okay the convolution of f convolve would um, G at So that's what convolution means. I can't read that. That's f of t, g of? G of zeta minus t. OK, f of t times g of zeta minus t. So you, when you integrate across that, you'll get a function in terms of zeta. Right. OK. OK. okay. Okay, so what I want to do now, and you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of my head's not really um, fully into this right now, and I'll, I'll try to prepare better next time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to argue that we can interpret this as, you know, this parameter is a parameter over momentum. that the average momentum is actually equal to the average of this operator. This is a self-adjoint operator. That's just multiplication by, you know, this, you know, this mm -hmm. quantity, zeta squared over 2m. So I want to argue that, um, and that by, is a probability distribution, So zeta parameterizes momentum. And we'll start calling it P. And the wave function in terms of momentum is given by this <clears throat> psi. Um, I see. So that's like phi, phi sub t of p, basically. You'll write right, it out. right. So we're, I didn't want to write it as p to begin with because that's sort of loaded. I want to actually derive it from the Born rule that this actually mm -hmm. deserves to be called momentum in the same way that x deserves to be called position, um, and it all comes from the Born rule. So anyway, we just transformed. I mean, we've done very little here. We just transformed into this new transform space where this. A kinematical term is simpler. It's just moment. It's just multiplication by a variable, um, and it's really going to help us in free space because in free space, in free space, this term disappears. V is zero, and so the Schrodinger equation is particularly simple in free space in in terms of momentum because you just have that. And then that can be worked out explicitly in terms of what we've already done. And you get just a out and out expression for the wave function of free space, a, a kind of an explicit um, expression in terms of in momentum. And then you can transform back into position space and that involves doing an inverse where you transform. And, uh, you know, it gets a little more complicated there, but it's, you know, it can be written down explicitly. So. It just simplifies the analysis in this particular situation where we're trying to 
evolve, you know, an explicit form of the wave function of free space. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the reason is, you know, that it's much simpler dealing with multiplication of a wave function than repeated differentiation of a wave function. So I'm just thinking, like you said, you know, if the potential is zero in whatever way, then this will be simpler in momentum space. It'll be a simpler equation. And I'm wondering, like, with regards to the original equation uh, where you have uh, in terms of position, that would be simpler if your wave function was independent of x, I guess, or position, right? I mean, like, it would be... Um, well, yeah, I mean, you're talking about uniform. I mean, that's, you can have a uniform wave function. It's not particularly simple. I mean, not particularly useful. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, so, um, and, I mean, again, mm -hmm. time evolution is simple if you have eigenfunctions of the, of the Hamiltonian. And you can, you can argue that in free space, the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are simply plain waves, you know, e to the i x, you know, e to the i kx or something. Um, and you can argue that way. You could you could go ahead and do the same, exactly the same analysis that I'm about mm -hmm. to do, doing that. You don't have to go to momentum space. But I want to go to momentum space because this is how I think of, you know, this is, I think, a better way, a healthier way of thinking about the Hamiltonian. Because... Mm -hmm. This connects to what I'm interested in, this projection business that I, mm -hmm. I told It's easier writing down the projection, understanding the projection in mm -hmm. the momentum domain than in the position domain. I think in some sense, the position domain is the wrong domain for looking at the wave function. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, anyway, so I, I uh, next time we'll argue that Zeta is actually momentum, and then we'll solve the Schrodinger equation in, in free space, which is quite simple in, in the mm -hmm. momentum domain. And then we'll transform back into uh transform back into the spatial domain. And uh you get an explicit formula. It's you know, it's a little more complicated than wave, than the original wave packet, um, but it can be it can be analyzed quite easily, and we'll find out how fast that wave packet spreads out. So what did we do today? How would you <laughs> name what that? What we did, we actually did very little. We, we reviewed what we had, mm -hmm. and then we, then we um, transformed into this new, into this new variable, um, zeta. And again, we just did it for mathematical reasons, so it simplified this term here. It made it made mm -hmm. our differentiation term in the in the Hamiltonian a multiplication term. But then mm -hmm. we're gonna, you know, so that's all we did. You know, so we had the we talked about the Fourier transform, how to do that, the scaled Fourier transform, and uh, then I'm gonna argue next time that this zeta actually does para parameterize parameter parameterize momentum, and that's. So again, so again, the Born rule is going to give that to us. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. All you got to do, it's that simple. You go to the Patreon page and you do a search, Math for Wisdom. When you get there, you click on it and you put a few things in that need to be inputted and you're done. You're, you are now a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter. I did it. Why not? Give it a try.